Hi, I'm Kathy Bissell. Welcome to the Golf Show 2.0. We have an extra special guest this week. He's a lawyer, and uh, he's going to help us sort out the Live lawsuit, PGA Tour lawsuit, Patrick Reed lawsuit, every other lawsuit in the world. Gary, why don't you tell everyone a little bit about Alex? So oh, I thought you were talking about me since I typed my name in, in as Perry Van Mason. I thought maybe I fooled you. <laughs> no. Now, uh, we've got Alex Maselli here. Not only has he got a legal background, he's a real life lawyer, but he's a real live golf writer. So Alex, Correct. thanks for being here. <laughs> Look, we got all these suits going on in golf. I think we ought to explain what's, what's happening. Can you start with the original live lawsuit that a number of players actually signed on to in what, what's their case, and do they have a, any shot at winning it? Well, first of all, you never know about, I should say thank you for having me on. You never know about lawsuits. Now, everybody can bring one. Uh, you don't know if they can win or lose. Uh, it depends. In this particular case, they're asking for a jury trial, which means that they're somewhere, some way, they're trying to play on the sim something other than what the case is, yeah. the sympathies of jurors, because... If you had the law in your favor, I think you would be asking for a bench trial, which would mean the judge would make the decision, uh, and the judge would use the law and not be not be swayed by emotional fact, emotional semi facts, or whatever it may be. Uh, but in this case, they've asked for a jury trial, so I think that they they're looking for a way to um, be able to plead their case beyond just the facts themselves of the law. So you just never know in those situations what the chances are of them winning or losing. Um, Alex, I think a lot of people would agree that it's an antitrust case yeah. that uh, that they're bringing, and I think a lot of people, when they hear antitrust, which is a, mon a monopolistic tendencies by, in this particular case, the BJ Tour, <clears throat> I think most people would probably agree that the tour sounds to be like a monopolistic kind of entity itself. Um, back about 20 years ago, the FTC, the Federal Trade Communications uh, Group part of the federal government looked into the possibility that the PJ Tour is an antitrust organization and they were they were going down that road actually to start going in and investigating deeper because they made an initial finding that they were um, and Tim Fincham who at the time had was the commissioner of the PJ Tour had previously worked in in government in Washington found a way through Congress to squash that investigation so now you look when you I think it's called lobbying <laughs> I go squash, you go lobby, and that's fine. Yeah, um, it's, hey, it's how the game's played. There's nothing wrong with it. Right. Uh, well, there's a question if there's anything wrong with it or not, but in this particular case, that's what happened. Oh. <laughs> um, and so uh, now we're 20 years later, and a lot of things the tour does, you start wondering about, you've been covering the game long enough, I've been covering the game long enough, to wonder about some of the stuff they do, but at the end of the day, you're not really sure if it's an antitrust thing or not. There's a, there's a line somewhere. Yeah. When they do something, there's a line. And when you cross that line, obviously you've violated that I trust. And when you haven't crossed that line, so look, like you just said, they're they're a business, right? And yes. at the end of the day, they're trying to do what they have to do to keep their business going. So yes. they're always going to do things that people are going to look at and say, ah, I wonder about that. But but the question is really not about the ad. It's the question about where they've clearly stepped over the line. And there's probably some some situations where that may or may not have occurred. I, I can't figure that because... Not something you'll determine down the road. Alex, so, uh, yes. one one of our previous guests said, you know, regarding something like a jury trial, he said it's hard for people to feel sorry for a bunch of rich golfers who want to get richer, and so they're they're after the PGA Tour somehow for damages. Plus, a bunch of them have dropped out. Have they dropped out because the Live organization got in? And you know, what does a public investment fund of Saudi Arabia have to gain by suing the PGA Tour, really, is what it comes down to. Well, I think, first of all, if, 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 if whoever that person was that suggested that, you know, they want a jury trial because they're a bunch of rich players, well, there's rich players on both sides. I mean, oh, if yeah. you want the PGA Tour to come to live, you're a rich player, you're a richer player now than you probably were on the PGA Tour. Yeah. So I think you can look at it and say, it's the rich asking and trying to fight the other rich. I mean, I, I don't think that that makes sense, much sense. Um, I think the, the players dropped out. Some of them dropped out because I, I generally think they didn't realize what they were getting themselves into. Yeah. Which is not a surprise because they're only professional golfers. It doesn't make them rocket scientists. Yeah. So, um, so that's the first issue. 
I think the other issue is is that in some cases they decided, look, I don't really want to be sitting in the PGA Tour. I have still have friends there. A lot of these guys are still friendly with each other. They have friends there, and they, there's a realization that if I'm suing the PGA Tour, I'm actually suing my friend, and I don't want to be doing that. And there's really no ups. What's the upside? And that's that's really the issue. And I've asked Liv this before, the Liv attorney for this, after they lost the temporary restraining order issue yeah. where they wanted to try to get guys to play in the FedEx Cup playoffs. So what are you trying to gain, accomplish now? And they're like, well, these guys still want to have a chance to play on the PGA Tour. And I go, no, they don't. Most of them don't care. If they really wanted to continue to play on the PGA Tour, they wouldn't have resigned their membership. Because once you resign your membership, you don't have it. You basically, your way of getting on the PGA Tour is the same way as Gary's is getting on the PGA Tour, going to going yeah. to Q school or something like that, or getting a Monday qualifier or getting a sponsor's exemption. Yes. They, they, they don't want to do that. They're, that. they're done. Most of these guys are done. Yes. So this, if the lawsuit, the whole end of the day, if the lawsuit is just to get these guys to get access to the PGA Tour, it's a waste of time and money, which I've kind of written. So, um, <laughs> well, I, I, think I think that's the answer to the question I was looking for. You, you don't think that you think it's a waste of time because they don't really have a chance on that one. No, I think it's a waste of time because because even if they win, what they don't want to. Oh uh, well, right. Okay, I see what you're saying. I mean, why? You know, it, it's like we're fighting. We're fighting to get, you know, the deer into the, into the wilds. The deer are already in the wilds. Why am yeah. I fighting to get the deer in the wilds already? It doesn't make any we're sense. Fighting. Hey, I'm suing you for something I don't want. Right. That's exactly right. Now the problem is is that uh, the PIF is, is uh, Kathy brought up and in Live Golf, they're. They're, they've been offended. They feel like they've been offended, which they have been. I mean, the tour has done everything possible to make them sound like the, you know, the worst people in the world. Which, and I'm not getting into if they are. No. Or I'm just saying they've made they made that attempt. Yeah. And so, they don't really want to deal with the tour. They don't want to deal with the tour. They don't want to have a you know where they were willing to have a phone call and sit down and talk and negotiate and come up with some kind of plan that makes sense to everybody. They're not as willing to do that now. And so I think they're just feeling. You know what? We got a lot of money. It doesn't cost us. It doesn't. It's not costing us a lot to go through the tour and make them suffer. So, in some ways, I believe that that's that's how they feel. Because what are they get? What are they getting out of the equation? Even if they win, like I said, they're going to get players to get back on the PJ tour. Well, that does nothing for Liv. I mean, Liv is only concerned about their 14 events a year. And to be quite honest with you, even if these guys get back on tour and somebody wants to play, a Taylor Gooch wants to play or Matt Jones still wants to play. He's going to have to play 15 events plus the 14 yeah. events. That's 29 events. Yes. That ain't happening. Yes. So that's, that's right. It's going to fall off the map anyways. Right. So it's, it just makes no sense at all for us to be doing this lawsuit. But that being said, that's where we are. <laughs> that's totally where we are. Um, tell, tell us a little bit. So that that's the first suit. The next one Where's is the other one. The PGA Tour's counter suit, yeah. which maybe you just do as a part of trying to, uh, you know, intimidate them legally. But what, what's the counter suit about? And tell us about its merit and or lack well, thereof. It it mentioned uh, Gary wondered, and I also wondered. It mentioned the term players having contracts with the tour. I know they sign something, don't they, every year before they start. That's a membership, that's a membership agreement. Right. Which is a little different than a contract. A contract, yeah, that's what I thought. So I'm not sure that it's, okay, so yeah. what yeah, what can I, you explain about that? Well, I, what I can explain this is I think the, the attorneys on the tour side have used the term incorrectly. Yeah, okay. I don't okay. believe there is a contract. There's a membership I don't think so either. every year. And that tells you what you know, to be a member. This is what you get if you're a member. And this is what you have to and do. To do be a member. this, this is it. Right, yeah. Right. Okay. So that's now you can. I guess you can broadly say you could use the term contract for that, but it's 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 something different than that. And it's, and actually, when when you hear the term that these guys are independent contractors, and then you hear they're under contract to the tour. I mean, people sit there and say, well, well that can't be possible. It doesn't right. make any sense. But the bottom line is, is that I think the tour feels like they have been disparaged in some way, shape, or form. Um, and their business has been affected, and because of those two things, uh, they feel like, and the business being affected can be a broad stroke. It could be, you know, we lost money, we couldn't do certain deals, um, we've lost players. Yeah. But again, 
you know, the thing about the lost player thing is that, okay, so you lose a player. A player says, okay, I don't want to be a member anymore. I'm leaving. Okay, so leave. So yeah. the tour is like, well, you know, we don't want them to leave. They shouldn't have been able to leave. Well, that's not how the deal works. The deal is yeah. that you can, the person can leave because, again, they're an independent contractor. They can leave whenever they want to leave. Now, the yeah. fact is, is that now that you, now that your fines or your suspensions mean nothing to them, because that's that's the only recourse that the tour had if somebody is acting up, basically, as a member. Since those recourses don't matter to those players anymore, you have no recourse, and you're upset about that as well. So, I mean, it's like you can't, that, that, that's something you can have a conversation with amongst yourselves, but it's not something to sue to live or the PIF will. Now, I had an interesting uh, Q&A in a media scrum at Jim Furyk's tournament this week in which I asked him if he knew where it was possible to find an updated version of the PGA Tour handbook which has the rules and regulations in it because the most recent I could find online was in 1920, 1919 and 1920 and I thought well it probably has not changed substantially since I think then. You mean 2019, right? So, yeah, to, what did I say? The one in 1919 wasn't really. No, 2019, 2020. No more in <laughs> and I asked him about it. I said, there's a section at the, in the back that has to do with suspensions and things like that. And he said, I've never read it. Right. And I thought, how many other players have never read the handbook and they don't know what's in it? And even if they, they would not have, they may have changed it slightly since then, but it's written broadly because it has to be written broadly to accommodate, like I said to somebody, elephants falling out of the sky. I mean, you just don't know what's going to happen. Well, they, so, they've definitely changed the parts about gambling because that's totally changed. Yeah. But yeah, it's, I think she's right. I don't think too many players have read the handbook. Right, yeah, well, I mean, these guys want to do, look, they show they, up. They want to do what they want to do. They, they, they show, show up, up, they play golf, they get paid. It's, right. they you know, up, and they're, not, they're nice to people. Is, tell me the locker room is, where do I right. get lunch, where's yeah. the first tee, you know, what's yeah. the, what, where's my rental car, what's the situation yeah. on laundry. Uh, that, that's, that's the broad strokes. 99.9% right. .9 of the guys that show up to a BJ Tour event, that's how they think. Yes. Because that's that's a problem they have to solve in order to get to the golf course, which is what they really want to do. Right. I thought so. it was interesting. John Rahm won the Spanish Open, and he started talking about the whole live situation, and really about the Ryder Cup. And he goes, you know, to me, the Ryder Cup is the best players of the U.S. against the best players of Europe. Period. I think everybody should be playing, but it doesn't look good. And I thought, is the Ryder Cup? the one thing that can maybe drag these sides to the bargaining table? And then I thought, well, no, the PGA Tour no. is not even involved in the Ryder Cup, so that's not going to be a factor. But the European players are already, Fitz, Pat, Matthew Fitzpatrick said something similar, uh, Rory's the opposite, but several of these guys have already started saying, we need to have our best guys there, and uh, I wonder if that's that's a factor that won't be involved in the lawsuit, but I wonder if that's something that gets these sides get together and talk, which seems unlikely. Seth Waugh Seth said something in one of his press conferences. Alex, have you talked to him about it? He said something yeah. about all of the members of the PGA of America have to be members of the PGA Tour, and so they couldn't bring the other people back because they weren't members of the PGA Tour any longer. Is that right? Yeah, basically, uh, to be a member of the PGA of America, there's different ways to be go about it, but one of the yeah. ways is, is that the PGA Tour member because is also a PGA of America member. So uh, the problem is that uh, Dustin Johnson, let's say, who's not a PGA Tour yeah. member anymore, he's not going to be a PGA of America member, which means he would not be able to be eligible. Right. Um, and and what's odd is you go back through history on the Ryder Cup, there were times when Jack Nicklaus and Todd Moxton right. and Arnold Palmer weren't eligible to play in Ryder Cups. When Paul Lazinger. When they yeah, were best Paul in the Lazinger world. You know, so, um, so it's not unusual, but in this particular case, it seems a bit weird because obviously you want your best players. Yeah. On the European side, it was a completely different kettle of fish. Yeah. First of all, they have a they have a situation going on where there's a arbitration happening in February, 
where that arbitration will determine if these players can continue, meaning European tour players, can continue to play on the European tour or not. Uh, and so that's going to get addressed there. Uh, is they're using an arbitration system that usually is used for drug testing or drug issues in the sport. In this particular case, it's going to be it's being this is being decided instead. So that'll happen in February slash March, and from there that will change things to some extent. Now the problem is, is that the way the system works, um, Luke Donald, the European Tour captain, has six picks, which is unusual because usually they only have the most they've ever had was four. Um, but he's going to have six picks, and that's going to be necessary because if you have guys like, let's take, even though I don't know if he would be there, but take a Sergio Garcia who's not playing on the European Tour, basically. Uh, currently, if he doesn't play one more event on the European Tour, won't even have his card for next year. Mm -hmm. So he may not even be eligible to play on the Ryder Cup. But that being said, if, if in fact, he, he doesn't play enough next year and doesn't get enough points and he's not in the top six in points, the only way he's going to get on the team is to be picked by Luke Donald. And that, I think there's a reason why they have six picks this year. Um, because it was made, the decision was made relatively recently, within the last six months. And the lift thing had been starting up and everybody was aware of what was going on. So I think um, Ron and Fitzpatrick are right. They want to see the best team. Just like we talked about this to some extent at the President's Cup, where we thought not only the U.S. team not have the best team because Dustin Johnson was on that team, but clearly the internationals didn't have the yeah. best team because all the guys that weren't on that team. Right. So um, this is the same thing. The U.S. can get by without a Brooks Kepka or a Phil Mickelson or a Dustin Johnson, or we could go down the list. But the Europeans, I don't think, can easily get by with missing, potentially missing some players. And you have to remember one other thing. We don't know who's going to jump the live next. The right. assuming that no one else is jumping the live between now and the end of the year is a, is a, is a mistake. Yes, well, it's I, not just I, I don't know who is. There, Alex. Uh, it's the European Tour itself. You talked about the arbitration hearing coming oh, up. Yeah. The European Tour is in a different situation. The, you know, the DP World Tour, as it's called. The artist formerly known as the European Tour. They're in a different situation. They've got nobody playing in their events. They are, they are in trouble. They need these guys to be able to... I mean, I would not be surprised if they somehow wind up allowing... I mean, I know they're in a business agreement with the PGA Tour, but... They are in desperate need of some marquee names, and I could see them uh, being swayed to let some of these live guys play because they need those names because they don't have anybody right now. Well, you know, you wonder uh, if um, you I never mean, know who's going to show up. You know, maybe there's another Tom Kim in Europe. We don't know yet. Right. Well, right now there isn't. There isn't. No, uh, there they, isn't. They don't have marquee names, and they need some. Well, the but thing we, is, if there was a Tom Kim in Europe. He'd be coming to the United States. Yes. Right. So he wouldn't be playing very much in Europe anyway. So that's, and that's but he would. He could still. He could still be picked for their Ryder Cup well, team. Well, right, exactly. Um, I think that um, it's a difficult situation on the European side. There's no. Problem. Oh yes. Because they could have, after Rory and John Rahm and Matt Fitzpatrick and there's probably a couple other guys I'm not thinking about right now. But after them, good luck. I mean, really good luck. I mean, it's like picking. You know, you're picking the lesser of two guys. I mean, the less and the lesser guys is what the problem is, and what Gary's saying. And it's not, you know, and this is the the tour's finding the same thing. I mean, you looked at the leaderboard last week in Las Vegas. Okay, so Tom Kim, people know from the Presidents Cup. Obviously, Patrick Cantley had a great run on Saturday, got him in, got him in the mix. But start looking at some of these other guys. Who are they? And I'm not saying they're bad golfers. I'm just saying if you're if you're Sanderson Farms in Mississippi, or if you're the, the Shriners, or if you're, you know, the next event, whatever it is, if you're at these events, you want somebody to be able to hang your hat on and say, so, so is coming here. And if you look back, I would say two years ago, and look what the tour used to promote their events the, the next following week, you would see a lot of a Bubba Watson, or a Brooks Kepka, or a Dustin Johnson, or, or an Abe Answer. I mean, I can go through the list. And a lot of those guys yeah. are no longer around to promote. So that means you're promoting, you're not even talking about guys that anybody knows anything about. Well, it's going to, my theory on that is it's just going to take time to develop some new Sam Burns's and Scotty Schefflers. I think that they're going to be out there. They're going to be from different countries. 
but it might take 18 months to two years for those players to surface. And we just haven't seen them yet. And right now, Liv is disrupting the ordinary course of, of player development and has, has cut through uh, one level of, of player and taken those off the table. And now other people are showing up and we just have to wait for them to show up and see what they can do, like a Tom Kim. They're also, they're also getting so much attention that these PGA Tour events are having a hard time getting a headline uh, yeah. Again, what's going on somebody winning $4 million on Liv. So well, Liv is working on a lot of fronts. Oh, yeah. yeah. And, and the, the kid from Arizona State, you know, leaves Arizona State, and now all of a sudden won $4.175 uh, yeah, million. Dollars. Oklahoma State, yeah, Chicago. Yeah, Oklahoma State. And now, and and then you got James Pyatt, who was the U.S. Amateur Champion last year yeah. from, Michigan, from Michigan State, who, who really is not that great of a golfer. Shows up in the top ten. I mean, the kid's only getting better now, if you look at his numbers. You know, he, he made almost, he made like $700,000. I mean, let's be honest. Where are these, where would these kids be making this kind of money if they're playing on tour? They would be struggling. Right, exactly. To make so, that kind of money. And so, so I don't, I don't blame them for taking the right, money. But, but if you're starting, but if you're starting out and you're thinking, okay, do I do PGA tour or do I do the live tour? If I get on live, I'm, I would be actually foolish not to go to live. Absolutely. Well, let's let's move on to the uh, the big the big lawsuit we're waiting to talk about is Patrick Reed against the world, let's see. Uh, against Golf Channel, Brandel Chambly, and then he yeah. refiled it to move to a different court, I think in Florida, and he added a few more names. Uh, are, did he name? Are you one of the defendants in that suit, Alex? And no, no. Actually, Patrick, are, are you insulted that you're not? <laughs> you know. You know, I talked to Patrick about this when they were playing uh, in Massachusetts, and this is before they moved the case. And I think right. it's important for people to understand, it's not often that you can do what exactly Patrick Reed did here, which is called forum shopping. You can't move from yeah, one okay. forum to another because you think one forum is beneficial to you versus the other one. And it was pretty clear that the judge in Houston, who was a very knowledgeable person, not only about the law, but about professional golf, it was going to be a problem for Patrick Green. <laughs> so, <laughs> there you go. So they decided, they decided it's time to move someplace else, which they moved to Florida. Okay, so that being said. Um, you know, the, the thing about uh, reporting, and Gary, you can speak to this, Kathy, you can as well. You know, we write a lot of different things. Some of it interesting, some of it not. A lot of dribble, this and that, and everything else. But the bottom line is if we're protected, we're protected by the First Amendment to be able yes. to write what we want to write. Now, obviously, there are certain situations where the First First Amendment does not protect you, according to the Supreme Court. Right. And those are cases where you know you're writing something that's false and that is harmful to an individual or saying something that's false or harmful to an individual. That is not, I do not believe that either Brandel Chantley or I don't, um, Eamon Lynch or any of the other guys that are mentioned actually did that. I think they actually believe in what they were saying or what they wrote and you can disagree with it you can say it's not right but that in itself is not enough for a lawsuit and so um i think that at the end of the day the patrick reed lawsuit will go down in flames it'll never hit i don't see it ever getting to trial um because the court will never let it get that far and i don't care who the judge is and what president um nominated that person to be that judge um it's just it's not a case that makes sense and it will not it should not go to trial does, alex does, does patrick reed even really want a judge or a bunch of jurors rehashing over all these things he's done over his career and bringing them up i mean talk about bad publicity yeah no you, I, you can I go back over his misdeeds or perceived misdeeds and rehash him again in front of everybody, and it's not going to help you. Even if you were to win the case, which you probably wouldn't, but even if you were, you're going to remind everybody of this stuff you've done. And, that is, is, you know, that and is you go, and, yeah. And you go all the way back to college in Georgia. Yeah. Yes. Is there isn't there something about being a public figure and having it be hard to bring any kind of a case yeah. like this because there's a, people. There's a, there's there's a different level, but that still being said, if you, you know, again, if you know you're saying something that's absolutely incorrect and you're saying yes. it anyways for the, to, to harm that person, right. that doesn't matter if you're a public figure or not. 
And these, these people may not like Patrick. And, and in what they say and what they uh, write may come across strongly that they don't like him or they don't like what he's done. And he may be feeling that more than think, the facts Patrick, in the case, you know? I think Patrick, what Patrick feels is that when he's out at tournaments and people say stuff to him, he feels like the reason why they are hostile to him is because of the things that have been written and said about him. Well, that's how he looks at it. You can disagree with him whatever yeah. you want, but I mean, that, that's how he's looking at it, and that's the position he's taking for why he's bringing the lawsuit. Do you think just filing that this lawsuit might be a way to get the guys on TV, especially to maybe cool it with their Patrick Reed comments while this no. case is underway? I don't think so. I mean, I don't okay. think Comcast cares. You know, I mean, I know what the number is, but they're at was seven hundred fifty million, whatever he's asking, which is yeah. Over. I mean, it's, it's he's not going to get that. He's yeah, he'd have to win two live tournaments to get that much money. Yeah. <laughs> um, or 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 ten thousand men at tournaments. <laughs> oh, please tell us about that, Alex. What have you heard about Mena? You know, um, I have. And I would say I have to be honest with you, which I, I'm trying to be all the time, so I, I shouldn't say that, pre preface it with that. But. So first of all, I didn't. I wanted to make sure I even knew what MENA stood for. Oh, I don't. I looked up what tour it was, but I don't know what it stands yeah, for. It's Middle East, North Africa. So that's what okay. the tour is. Okay. It's a developmental tour, part of the Asian tour, or associated with the Asian tour. So their, their purses are $75,000. Right. $75,000. So the, thing, the funny thing was, is if you finish T-128, or T, or I'm sorry, 48, in the Minotaur, you got $400. And wow. And if you finish T-48 in, in the Live Tour, it's something like $130,000. Yeah, $75,000, that's about half of PGA Tour Canada, and they're at the bottom of the pay scale, too. Right. So, anyways, here's what I, this is what I don't understand. The system, meaning the uh, worst official world golf rankings, has been set up by the PJ Tour, the Majors, the DP World Tour, the Asian Tour, the Australasian Tour, the, um, the South African Tour, all those guys. They are all the ones that put this thing together. So in, in large part, it's the enemy if you're live, right? Yes. So you have to, you then in turn, have to go to the enemy and say, what do we do so we can participate in this system that you have? And at every turn, you feel like they're trying to thwart you. I mean, obviously, that's what they're trying to do. They're not saying it publicly, but at every turn, that's what they're trying to do. So you find a way to get around all of that and get world ranking points. And then they still find a way to say, well, we got to take a look at it. And I think it's absurd, absurd. Because, first of all, if you're the PJ Tour or the DP World Tour, what you basically want is you don't want these guys to get into your event. You don't want them to have world ranking points to get into your event. In turn, you don't want them to get into major. You really, you would hope that they would fall off the earth is what you would Yes. Hope okay. Yeah. And they will if you just yes. give them the meta points. Because at the end of the day, how many, how many, how much points are you going to get out of a live golf event that's under the meta umbrella? Almost it's not nothing. going to be the same amount of points yeah. as you would get like you got in Las Vegas. So that means you'd have to play so many events, you'd have to play yeah. so well, which is not going to happen. So eventually you're right. just going to be, you're going to fall out. So just let them yes. fall out naturally. Because uh, they have some interesting players at the top of their tour and they have some at, at live. And they have some interesting players who have been good in the past, but they don't have top to bottom the quality of players well, that either the European Tour or the PGA Tour have. But even if they did, the way the point yes. structure is, Mena doesn't they get fall the same kind of points. Because yeah. it's a three, it's a three round tournament versus four. So just give yes. them the extra points, let them go ahead and do what they want to do. And just and, and just wait. A problem. Yeah, just wait. Well, the, the only thing is it's not as if the world golf rankings are changing the rules to keep these guys out. The rules are the same as they've been, although they change the, how the points are passed out. But, you know, it's not like they just put in this, you got to average 75 guys in the field. You've got to have a cut. You've got to have a path to the tour. 
it, you got to play 72 holes. Those were the rules going in, and Liv knew it, and I, I don't but, know how they he, thought they were going to get past that. Let me, let me just pass. Let's go back for a second. They're not rules. They're right. actually suggestions. There ah. you go. That's, they're that's actually what they came up with. You're, that's what they're using. You're correct. Right. They're suggestions, and then when you get down to the fine print, which says basically, we as we as the official world golf rank can basically ignore <laughs> all criteria in deciding if we want to grant you access or not. Which, which <laughs> they did for that Tiger Tigers event. Right. So, uh, yeah. so the fact that you fulfill every criteria here. Does not grant, does not guarantee you acceptance, and the fact that you don't meet any of the criteria doesn't mean that you will fail. Now, okay, what kind of what, what are you supposed to do? What are you supposed to do then? Well, there you go. Get... That says it all. And and Peter Dawson, who's former head of the RNA, uh, he, he's he's not a guy who likes new ideas, so I don't think you're ever going to get past him. Well, he's I mean he's he's just administering what the system is. I mean he's not creating. Yes. They're not you know. But he has, they, all, they have the power, you say, to make up whatever rules they want, and they aren't going to go. You said they're the enemy. Why would we Why would we try to help you? So is this like Monty Python, nudge, nudge, wink, wink, say no more? Yeah. Or is it's it more formal than that? It's very no, it's similar more to... like the parrot's not dead, he's merely sleeping. <laughs> yeah. It's very similar to, the, to Monaghan, basically. They have a whole handbook, as you said, Kathy, earlier. They have a whole handbook. But in the end, there's this one paragraph that says, the commissioner can basically do whatever he wants. I don't remember so, seeing that in the handbook, but I'd have to go back there. and look really hard. It, it okay. is in there. It's, it's okay. I trust Congress. you. You know, Congress passes all these laws, and at the end of the law, every law they pass, it says, "But these will not be these will not be applied to Congress." So, yes. if it's a law on sexual harassment, fine. You know, everybody else has to abide by it except for Congress. Okay. It's good, I didn't to be, realize it's that. good to be king, in other words. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> well, I'm glad we could clear up Liv. Is there anything else you'd like to fill us in that we forgot to ask you, Alex, legal, legally? You know, have, Kathy, you ever, uh, have you ever been personally sued by anyone? Well, Cassie was talking, and I were talking earlier about, um, I just got back from Rome, from Marco Simone. And I have to say that uh, I wasn't expecting much. And actually, talking to Zach Johnson, he felt the same way. He wasn't expecting much. We both left there presently surprised on how nice the golf course is and how good the golf course will be for a, a match play venue. Um, there's definitely like three par fours that they can that fit to make them drivable par fours. So they will move the teeth back and forth, which is kind of interesting. And they're and they're spread out throughout the golf okay. course, so it's not just the at the end. So mm -hmm. like um, five, I think, is one. Sixteen is one. There's another one in there. There's a very short par five, which again will make it interesting. Yep. That you definitely will have to go for. Um, so there's a lot of good there's a lot of good match play holes in that golf course. Well, I thought it was great that the Pope got a gift from the two captains, a replica of Ryder Cup with their names on it, and this will be stored in the Vatican archive. So That's in the Vatican, a... they will have a golf souvenir with the names of the two greatest golfers of all time. Zach Johnson and Luke Donald. So what, you know, what a great moment for them. Gary, well, you know, I know the Pope. I know the Pope, and if they have to, they'll put that <laughs> on an <some> auction site. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, they should have taken Dean Knuth with them, so the Pope could have met the Pope of Slow. That's right. They got in a long day. Exactly. Well, I think that's uh, that's enough legal talk. Thanks for tuning in. Remember to click on like on the Golf Show 2.0 and click on subscribe and nothing will happen to you. But maybe someday if enough of you people do it, we might get 12 cents. <laughs> I thought we were we going really, for 17. We, our goal is just to get 12 cents, no more. 12 cents, so, that's it. Wow. 12 cents, that, we're aiming high. 12 so, cents and, and world acclaim. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> well, thank you for tuning in. Click like. Thank you to Alex Maselli. That was that was some good information there, Liv. Appreciate it. That was great. Thank you.